Welcome back to Seek of Strength and welcome to a very special video. Today we're going to be going through what is in Seek of Sleep and why it is useful for your sleep. Seek of Sleep comes in boxes of 30 sachets just like this. You mix them with about 200 to 250 milliliters of water, aka a small glass of water, and then you sip this over the course of an hour before you go to bed. Now, Seek of Sleep contains 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams of salt, 450 milligrams of magnesium bisglycinate, 30 milligrams of zinc picolinate, and 15 milligrams of activated B6 or vitamin B6 P5P. So we chose these particular ingredients and this particular route of ingredients because we wanted to stick to ingredients that were both proven in terms of their mechanistic data, but also ingredients that were more importantly dietarily necessary to get to sleep and maintain good quality sleep. So there's other ingredients out there that could be potentially very useful that interact via other mechanisms, such as some, maybe some plants, some herbs that could be quite useful in helping people get to sleep via either direct or indirect means. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with those, but we wanted to stick with this path because we felt that this is the most sustainable long-term. It had the most evidence safety profile and most likely to mitigate any side effects that those potential herbs might present when used. So before we get going on the particular ingredients used in Seek Asleep, there's just a couple of terms that I want you to get used to if you're not familiar with them. Some of you may already be familiar with those and that's fantastic. So there is melatonin. So you've probably heard of melatonin. It's usually sold as a supplement, but it's actually an endogenous hormone that you produce and is essential for getting to sleep. Melatonin raises in the evening prior to getting to sleep and promotes a quite a restful state. It's a central nervous system dampener and it's something that allows you to get to sleep and stay asleep. Now you can buy this over the counter in certain countries and there's quite a bit of back and forth in relation to if melatonin is useful to supplement exogenously. We don't have melatonin in the supplement and you can't even sell melatonin in Ireland but by and by, melatonin, you'll hear it quite a bit, is very, very useful for sleeping. Next, you'll hear things like serotonin or dopamine, and these are neurotransmitters which are very, very useful in promoting states of sleep where you're relaxed and you feel quite good. Then we'll hear stuff like GABA or glutamate receptors or GABA and glutamate themselves, which are also neurotransmitters. Now, GABA and glutamate are some of the most predominant neurotransmitters in your brain, and they are essentially on the opposite end of spectrums in what they promote in your brain. GABA is the one we're most interested in here. GABA is this restful promoting neurotransmitter. It is a inhibitor of neurological activity. It relaxes you, it dampens down your CNS, it lets you chill out before you go to bed or even any point during the day and hopefully helps you relax, which is exactly what you want before you go to bed. Glutamate is something that is on the opposite end of GABA. It is very, very useful in other areas when we're exercising, when we're trying to learn skills. However, glutamate is not useful in high levels before we go to sleep. GABA and glutamate are very closely interlinked because they are synthesized from each other via different biochemical cascades. We are trying to promote, before you go to bed, large amounts of GABA and melatonin. There's a couple of different things when we're looking at quality of data, and there's kind of three different areas I like to categorize them in my head. We have mechanistic data, interventionist data, and then anecdotal data. Now, anecdotal data is often kind of dissuaded or kind of looked down upon, but anecdotal data is still data. It just, however, doesn't account for a lot of uh, variables that are hard to objectively quantify when people report anecdotal data. However, if we see enough anecdotal data, it's always worth taking notice. Mechanistic data is probably one of the most important because if we understand mechanistic data, we means we understand entirely the system of cascades that happen when something is introduced into the body. So we understand the biochemical process from start to finish and we understand this very clearly. Very few aspects or very few molecules, whether that be pharmaceutical all the way to vitamin and minerals, are fully understood mechanistically, which is why there's a long way to go in relation to uh, medicine and science. However, a lot of things are very understood or very well understood mechanistically, or we have proposed means of what they do. Interventionalist data is when we literally get a group of people or mice or cell lines and we introduce a particular substance or molecule or environmental impact and then objectively control as many aspects of this study as possible to quantify and qualify hopefully the impact that this particular introduction has on these particular subjects, whether they be cell lines, bacterial, human cell lines, all the way up to human studies. 
Now, the most useful aspect across all of these is ideally you have mechanistic data, interventionist data, and hopefully anecdotal data from these interventionist trials, which they'll probably learn the mechanistic data via those. So let's start with zinc. So zinc is the second most abundant trace metal in your body. Questions or comments below, cookies will be given to someone who can determine the most abundant trace mineral in your body. Zinc helps regulate things like dopamine and serotonin. And we have a couple of interventionalist studies on humans, and we can look at their effect on sleep quality, which is great to have. Gradner et al. analyzed data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey on 5,587 American citizens to determine the dietary nutrients associated with short and long-term sleep duration. They have identified several vitamins and minerals whose dietary intake correlated with modification of sleep amounts and notably characterized zinc as one of them. According to the results, very short sleepers, so less than five hours, had significantly less zinc than those of normal or long sleepers. Now, even uh, an interventionist observational trial. So in 2009, a population study on 890 healthy Chinese residents evaluated the relationship between zinc and copper serum concentrations and several physiological factors such as sex, age, drinking, smoking behavior, and for us, most importantly, sleep. Regarding sleep, the mean concentration of serum copper remained constant regardless of the amount of sleep. However, the highest concentration of serum zinc was found in subjects sleeping a normal amount, seven to nine hours per night, compared to the short amount, less than seven hours, and the long sleepers greater than nine hours. Now we've an interventionist st study, two of these where people are actually given zinc and if the quality of sleep was quantified. So the most recent study determined the effect of zinc supplementation from natural sources, so zinc-rich oysters or zinc-containing yeast extracts, on 120 healthy subjects in a randomized controlled trial in Japan. Compared with the placebo, individuals treated for three months with daily zinc supplements demonstrated improved sleep onset latency and sleep efficiency compared to control subjects. So essentially, they got to sleep faster and their ability to stay asleep was improved. Now we have a, a double blind placebo control study here, which is generally the gold standard, but we always need to be careful with those. We have 54 ICU nurses were given zinc supplementation, and then they looked at their quality of sleep, both their subjective quality of sleep and their quality of sleep via the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which is widely recognized as the most objective form of measuring quality of sleep. And in this study, they also measured their serum zinc blood level concentrations. So versus the control group, the zinc group got better quality sleep, both subjectively and in the Pittsburgh SQUI. Also, alongside this, to collaborate the data to make sure it wasn't essentially a placebo-controlled idea, the control group, its quality of sleep did not improve. Their serum zinc levels did not increase because they weren't getting zinc. In our zinc group, their quality of sleep increased alongside their zinc serum concentrations. Now, if we're looking at the mechanistic data of zinc and why zinc works, we know zinc interacts with the central nervous system, but the exact mechanistic issue with how zinc works for sleep is not directly clear yet, but it's pretty close to being well established. So in a, another investigation, researchers had mice, and in these mice, we have a well-categorized sleep pattern, and they controlled for the amount of light, the dietary requirements of these mice, and they were administered zinc. Now it's an environmental cue, something that tells your body when to align with the natural circadian rhythm of the earth via the daylight hours. Zinc given in administrations during times when the mice should have been awake didn't promote sleepiness. However, at nighttime, when the mice were supposed to be asleep or would typically sleep more often, it promoted sleepiness not beyond physiological levels. So it modulated sleep in a tightly controlled fashion. Now, the mechanistic issue of why sleep might be better with uh, administration of zinc might be correlated to something known as glycinergic neurons. So in glycinergic neurons, when high levels of zinc are administrated, these activities are inhibited. These are tightly related to wakefulness. So when there's lower levels of zinc in these glycinergic neurons, the activity of the neuron is increased, which is not what we want prior to bed because these neurons are well correlated with a state of wakefulness. So first up, zinc, very important. And one of the reasons why it's useful to take zinc before bed, why we recommend taking Sika sleep before you go to bed, because at any other time of day, it might not be as effective while the vitamins and minerals will be present in concentrations. As we've seen here, it's very, very useful to take them before bed as they are related to your circadian rhythm. 
So magnesium is next up. So magnesium works in a slightly different fashion from zinc from what we've seen. So magnesium is also somewhat of a zeitgeber. It interacts with the cell circadian clock, but it primarily in relation to getting to sleep. Magnesium interacts with GABA, which is, as you may remember, something that promotes a restful state and is very important to getting to sleep. Now, magnesium interacts with this GABA, promoting this restful state and hopefully allowing us better quality sleep. Secondary to magnesium, and it's probably one of the most interesting aspects about magnesium, and uh, I'll leave the references below and I'd highly recommend reading it if you've any interest in, in biochemistry, but essentially magnesium is heavily involved in the cell's clock or its circadian rhythm and they call some of these clock proteins and their regulation. Now a group of researchers did some incredibly interesting research on the human cell lines and other eukaryotic cell lines and the effect of magnesium and how it affected the cell circadian rhythm. So cells generally display uh, their own circadian rhythm based on the inputs of light but some aspects of the cell's activity is based on the circadian rhythm that happens naturally. Now investigation in one of these studies was in relation does magnesium affect the cell clock so essentially what they found was something known as mTOR which a lot of you may have heard of if you're kind of interested in biochemistry it's the mammalian target of rapamycin it's something that a lot of uh, longevity folks are interested in and it's something we're very interested in, in of course with protein synthesis but essentially what they found was that the circadian activity of mTOR in these cell lines, both human and eukaryotic cell lines, was heavily regulated by the presence of zinc. Now, this one to me was probably one of the most mind-blowing things I came across when researching the specific attributes of zinc and circadian time. Almost mind-blowing to think that the individual operations of those cells are characterized based on a thing that we think is somewhat subjective, the human construct, but is still very much tightly entwined to what we want is a very regular circadian rhythm. And magnesium seems to be absolutely crucial in maintaining our circadian rhythm. Uh, it's something that you need. You need to be regular. You need to be consistent with when you're going to bed to promote this aspect of sleep. And magnesium is crucial for this. So a little expert from that. Uh, our, our initial ICP-MS observations were confirmed using this assay and we observed clear rhythms of magnesium over two days under constant condition in both cell types. Uh, bioluminescent reporters for clock gene activity reported in parallel confirmed the magnesium oscillation to occur roughly in antiphase with circadian markers normally expressed around dawn. So if magnesium wasn't present, we wouldn't see these same activities even in the presence of regular light, so constant conditions. Next up, we've got vitamin B6, or we've got activated B6, which is present in Sika sleep. So activated B6 is known as P5P or pyroxidol 5 phosphate. Generally, when you take vitamin B6, it is known as pyroxidine. There's a couple of different variations of B6, and all of these end up as P5P or pyroxidol 5 phosphate, which is what we've chosen to put into Sika sleep. Now, the use of P5P is there because essentially it's just further down along the cascade and should hopefully help you get the benefits of B6 a little bit faster and a little bit more of a fluid fashion when ingested via a supplement. Now, there's a very interesting aspect about supplementation with pyroxidine, which is a normal one of B6 that you would typically take, is that not always is the pyroxidine correctly metabolized by your body and as such, you can actually have symptoms of low B6 because the inactivated form of B6 binds to the receptors, whereas this doesn't happen with pyroxidol 5 phosphate, which is what's in Seek Asleep, P5P. Now, there's two different very, very interesting aspects in relation to B6. We have some interventionalist trials in B6 with a combination of other vitamins and minerals, but we have very clear mechanistic data on why we definitely need B6 in our diet to help us get to sleep. So there's two different aspects. We've got B6 is used as a cofactor for the change of glutamate, which you may remember as the excitatory neurotransmitter, to GABA. So it's used as a cofactor in this process to go from glutamate to GABA. GABA is the one we want when we want to get to sleep. Now, not only do we want GABA, we also want increased levels of endogenous melatonin. Guess what else is used in this transformation of melatonin or this production of melatonin in our body? Vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 is used in the cascade of L-tryptophan all the way to melatonin. So 
L-tryptophan is a dietary amino acid that's required and it's essential. Uh, and it's typically the thing you'll hear about, usually when Americans talk about Thanksgiving, we hear that kind of tryptophan sleep. This is generally thought to be levels of higher levels of tryptophan in Turkey, but that's by and by. So generally what happens is we get tryptophan, then we get 5-HTP, which is something you may have heard about because a lot of times, sometimes when people take a little bit of party drugs, they, they hope to take 5-HTP to get something known as serotonin, which is further down the cascade of 5-HTP. So it's L-tryptophan, 5-HTP, then we get to serotonin, and then serotonin takes us to melatonin. And B6 is essential in this transformation of 5-HTP to serotonin, which is then essential getting us to melatonin. So without B6, we couldn't get from our dietary aspects or dietary nutrients, we couldn't get to melatonin. So the B6 is crucial both in that GABA and that melatonin, both of which are very, very important to getting to sleep and staying asleep. Vitamin C is next up in our list of ingredients and we chose vitamin C because of its merit of benefits specifically in relation to sleep but we also have a couple of different other benefits in relation to that such as its ability to act as an antioxidant. Vitamin C is beneficial both in the areas of uh, cancer, uh, cardiovascular health and then its antioxidant effects. Now we have a couple of different investigations in relations to levels of vitamins and minerals in people's diets and their quality of sleep and in a large-scale investigation of an American diet we found that the second most abundant ingredient or second most important ingredient in relation to people's sleep quality is vitamin C. Now vitamin C often flies under the radar as a useful nutrient in relation to getting good quality sleep but there's actually quite a bit of data which I'll post below in relation to vitamin C being beneficial for sleep. The first up ahead of that was theobromine and then the second most important vitamin was vitamin C and this is found to be lowest in people who could only sleep for about five to six hours. So people who aren't able to get a long night's sleep or sleep a lot in a row, which you hopefully don't recognize yourself in, but if you're watching this video maybe, vitamin C was one of the most important, the second most important vitamin in relation to making sure you get longer sleep, which you may also remember zinc had a huge effect on in helping you get longer bouts of sleep. What was also investigated in relation to vitamin C in regards to sleep was that lower levels of vitamin C reduce the quality of restorative sleep. So there's a lot of different things around sleep and sometimes we call things sleep which shouldn't really be called sleep. We should maybe call them sedated. For example, if you smoked a lot of marijuana, it seems to sedate you rather than help you get good quality sleep. Also uh, included here would be the use of alcohol. So if you were drinking a lot before you go to bed, you may get to sleep very easily but in reality you're unconscious rather than getting resource of sleep. It seems that if you have lower levels of vitamin C, then you may not get as much resource of sleep, which you as an athlete should be highly concerned with. Now lastly, we've got salt. Now you might be wondering why is salt involved in a sleep supplement? Salt has been, I suppose, demonized a lot in recent years or in the last couple of decades, and maybe not so much in recent years. I think people are waking up to the importance of sodium in their diet. Now, the impact of sodium on sleep is actually very largely understudied, but the mechanism of why sodium helps or a high salt diet helps your sleep is actually mechanistically reasonably well understood. There is these enzymes known as SIK or salt inducible kinases. There is several of these active in your brain. It's generally present in most mammals. And this is actually how these were discovered in the 90s. So in the 90s, the presence of these SIKs was present when rats were fed a high salt diet. Now further to this, it actually became apparent with subsequent research that these SIKs or salt inducible kinases were crucial in the relation to our metabolism and our regulation of sleep. They interact with our what's known as superchiasmatic nuclei. Now, superchiasmatic nuclei, if you maybe pay attention to some of the sleep research, is something that's heavily involved in environmentally regulating how much melatonin we produce via the light coming in through our eyes and through a different cascade. So back to that melatonin again. The amount of light entering your eyes in the evening reduces, uh, interacts with our SCNs, and then we produce mer melatonin, or we're signaled to produce more melatonin, which again, if you don't have the B6, you won't be able to produce that melatonin adequately. And these SIKs, and these SIKs, or salt inducible kinases, interact integrally with the activity around metabolism and sleep regulation in our brain. They are crucial for our circadian rhythm. 
Now, why we included it in this is because generally people probably under salted meals, the likelihood if you're watching this, you probably eat a fairly well controlled diet and you don't overly salt your meals or you eat more what's seen as healthier foods, which often have reduced sodium content. Generally, we want in between three and six thousand milligrams of sodium per day. Now, obviously, people taking this are going to be athletes, people are exercising, that you would get adequate levels of sodium before you get to sleep and further aid in this action. Now, the most concerning thing about sodium intake is that the amount of sodium that can be sweated out during exercise can vary massively between individuals. So generally, as we said, there is usually needed between three and six grams of sodium per day. During exercise, researchers investigated some American football players and the amount of sodium they last per hour of exercise, so not literally per the full exercise, but simply per hour, was between 642 milligrams or up to 6.7 grams per hour was the amount of sodium they lost. So individual differences in sodium loss is huge and the amount of loss that can be made during exercise of sodium is absolutely enormous. So imagine you're trying to consume that much extra sodium in your diet if you're exercising. Now, if you're exercising, it's almost guaranteed if you're watching this that you're doing a lot of training. And if you're eating cleaner foods and you're training a lot and you're doing conditioning, there's a good chance you're losing a lot of sodium. So we wanted to ensure that we could bump this up a little bit and ensure you get some when it is necessary, hopefully when you're getting to sleep. So probably the next question you have is seek a sleep on sale yet? And the answer is not just yet. And I'll tell you why is because we're waiting for at the time of this print, we're waiting for two different labs to come back with us with final batch analysis to identify the ingredients and ensure they are what we want to be in the supplement. So you might remember that I have a background in quality control in pharmaceutical. I used to work as a lab analyst and I have an undergrad in biochemistry and the supplement industry is something that is rife with uh, corner cutting. It's rife with fake ingredients and you may from uh, you may have taken notice over the last few years that there's not a whole lot of regulation around food supplements. Now, in the pharmaceutical industry, when you finish a batch, you're testing it all the way along, but there's something known as final batch testing. And the principle is very simple. Before you give your medicine to someone, you need to ensure that that is what you say it is. It's very, very simple. You test it, ensure it is, you identify what is in it, and then the person taking it knows they can take it and be safe. In the food industry, across pretty much all of the world, we have very little regulation around supplements and what goes into supplements, which is one, why we wanted to get a manufacturer that was in Ireland. So we went and visited the facility and now we have quite a good relationship with those people. Now, we trust them. They trust their supplier. But the golden rule is that you assume everyone is guilty until proven innocent. And at the moment, we're literally waiting for two different labs to come back to us. We just picked two labs this time for this batch, for a first batch, to ensure that there was a, kind of a, a doubling up, essentially. There's no need. One lab is sufficient. One independent lab is perfectly fine. As long as you trust them. But for the sake of the first batch, we just wanted to see, send two different labs, ensure a little bit of consistency and give us a little bit more peace of mind. There's no obligation for us to do this, but this is something we want to do with every batch is provide you with the relevant identification testing when you get the batch so you can very easily see and very safely know that, that what's in your supplement is what you're taking. There is a huge amount of uh, unnecessary or unwarranted trust in the supplement industry. We talked to a huge amount of manufacturers and suppliers. Getting in-house testing done was incredibly irregular. In fact, I would say we only came across one company which actually does in-house testing. Um, getting a sample was ludicrous. It was literally, it was something you could do, but they said literally uh, nobody ever does this. Uh, one person we're talking to, a manufacturer in Eastern Europe, was literally laughed at the idea of a supplement. Couldn't, un couldn't fathom why would we get a sample of that supplement uh, because we wanted to test it. Obviously, you can't trust those. Uh, a lot of times they'll get what's this known as the COA or the Certificate of Analysis. And the Certificate of Analysis is literally a piece of paper from your manufacturer or your supplier uh, saying that this is what this is. That paper is worth, the information on that is worth about as much as that piece of paper is, which is essentially nothing. You don't know something is something until you test it. Test it either in-house or get it verified elsewhere. 
obviously I can't go buying a load of uh, mass specs and uh, UPLCs or HPLCs to do the testing far better to get someone who's well accredited well established and we sent this off to two different labs one is an independent tester in the US and one is a large scale company that operates all across uh, the European Union now European suppliers do have a bit more regulation than anyone else but again that doesn't matter just final batch testing send it off and we know that everything in this batch is all rosy so we've been waiting a while to get those results back and um, before we send it out to you so we've peace of mind you've peace of mind that you know when you get this from us that this is what we say it is i think a lot of the issues in the supplement industry when you hear people having terrible effects from supplements are probably coming from the fact that that supplement probably wasn't even what you're taking you've no idea if that is uh, there's actually the more we've delved into this over the, the months and years, the more I don't really trust a lot of supplement brands. And I'm very, very picky at the moment from who I get it from. And you should really be able to ask a supplement company, can you show me final batch analysis? It's not an obligation legally for them, but I think it's something that they should be able to provide you with if they're doing their due diligence. And that's what we're hoping to do with Seek Asleep is to guarantee that. Now, Seek Asleep is going to be competitively priced. It's going to be very, very convenient. It's going to cost you just a bit more than a euro per night before you go to sleep. That might not always be the case, but that's what we're hoping to get for you so you can get this regularly. We'll have a subscription option on the website when it's available to ensure that you get it regularly, but you'll also get a discount for signing up to the subscription so that it's posted to you regularly. You will get your tracking numbers and then you will be able to get the supplement posted to you regularly and you know you'll get it a little bit better of a price and hopefully it will assist in your nighttime endeavors. So I hope you enjoyed today's video, a little bit of a long one, but I wanted to go into why the ingredients work. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments, and I am titillated about the release of Seek Asleep. If it all goes well, Dara is very keen to release a pre-workout, um, which, you know, I don't really particularly love stims, but we know Dara does, and I know a lot of you guys love stimulants as well, and I understand the benefits of those. But for now, Seek Asleep is something we feel can positively impact you and your performance. It's something we're always talking about when people ask, what can I do for recovery? It's get better sleep. Now, I also have to say, to make a long video longer, is that I have to recommend, if you're taking Seek of Sleep, you need to be doing the regular important aspects around getting to bed at night, going to bed regularly, reducing the amount of light, uh, timing your nutrient intake based on what you feel is comfortable for you and what affects your quality of sleep, not look at your phone just before you go to bed, uh, sleeping in a well temperature controlled environment. I really think it's important if you do all of those that you're going to get a good quality sleep. Hope you enjoy it guys and I'm very excited for the launch of Seek Asleep which will be coming either late next week or early the week after just waiting on those final batch results to come in.